Hey guys, Razorblade Mango here, or um, maybe you'll hear me be referred to by my real name, Adam, throughout this conversation. So, this is going to be very different compared to what I normally do, because today I actually have a guest on the show, if you want to call it a show, and the context behind why I wanted to speak with this particular individual is that you guys have probably heard me talk about a game called Radiata Stories before on the channel, how I've mentioned that I think it's a lost gem, a diamond in the rough, one of the most underappreciated games ever made, and it's an eternal frustration of mine that Square Enix has not given it the love and attention that it's deserved. And also, I wanted to talk about this specific petition that this individual started called Revive Radiata, which is, I think, and I'll be honest, I usually think petitions online about video games are a waste of time. Like, I'll point to the, the Last of Us Part 2 one. The remake Last of Us Part 2 one is the most recent example. But I feel like in this case, this is one of the very rare game-related petitions that I see that I think I am on board with 100% because this individual has built this really cool community around the love that Radiata Stories has, like, among its fan base. Uh, and rather than talk about the petition itself, once I finally got some time to talk about it, make a video on it, I thought instead, why don't I just go to the source and speak to the source of the petition instead? Why don't I talk to the individual who started it? Because this is a rare, unique treat for me to have somebody on the show that actually knows what writing out of stories is. Most people, when I bring it up, they go, what, what the hell are you talking about? What is this? But I am very, very honored and very, very pleased that this individual has agreed to speak with me about Radiata Stories um, and revive Radiata, all things Radiata Stories. So today I have the honor of talking to the legend, the myth, revive <laughs> Radiata. Um, please, sir, introduce yourself to the audience. Hey folks, uh, my name's Eli Farmer. Um, that was a great intro, by the way. I need Thank to get you, you at um, <laughs> all the events to bring me on stage. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm happy to sit down and chat. And again, Roddy Out of Stories, big part of my life, uh, has a very special place in my heart. And it's been really great to see that that special place exist in the hearts of so many other people. Um, and so I'm just really pumped to sit down and talk about Radiata Stories and talk a little bit about the petition, how we got started, and maybe answer some more questions that uh, we've got lined up down the pipe. I am too. Um, I must admit, though, I'm a little nervous considering that this is the first time we're, I'm talking to somebody who I've never actually talked to extensively before having them on the show. <laughs> um, so I hope I hope this turns out really well. Um, I'm gunning for it to turn out really well. So I guess the first thing I want to ask is, who are you? specifically like what is, what is your history um what uh, i knew i know you are a you're trying to break into the voice acting field as far as um video games and or whatever work you might get um please like like let me what is what is that all about please please inform me <laughs> yeah absolutely um so a little bit more about my background and my story my relation so i've been a lifelong video game learner uh, a lover rather um i got my first console when i was probably five years old it was a playstation Damn. one i was actually i was uh, i was actually born the same year that the playstation one came out fun fact um but i remember my little memories of my dad and me playing mortal kombat and him just viciously beating me into the wall and like showing me no mercy um so that was my exposure to video games but um we were always a sony household so it was always like my mom was we're only going to ever buy you PlayStations, and that's pretty much it. Then I got a little <laughs> bit older and was able to buy my own things. But um, because of that, you know, I lucked up, and I had a love for RPGs, especially uh, JRPGs, as I got exposed to them down the line. The first one that I ever, I would say, played extensively was probably Final Fantasy X. Um, and so my that favorite was like one. My yeah. Yeah. So first foray into JRPGs, and everyone kind of knows this, but at that time... When it comes to JRPGs, the PlayStation 2 is the system where you, you couldn't miss. You know, you had the Dragon Quest, the Final Fantasies, and so mm -hmm. many great titles mm. from Square. Kingdom Hearts. Uh, and so, I can't forget Kingdom Hearts. Yes, big Kingdom Hearts fan. Um, and so going down the line and then later getting introduced to Radiata Stories. Um, but throughout my course of playing so many different games, um, I was lucky enough, I would say that I was kind of born in the time period where voice acting became a really big part of video games. Like in the early 90s, late 90s. 
some games had voiceover, but it wasn't really like the most top-notch sort of thing. It wasn't until I would say the early to mid 2000s that they were like, hey, we're going to really start putting a lot of effort and energy into the the actors that we get for these projects. And so I was always like, oh my gosh, that'd be like such a cool job. And, you know, I'd always remember these little like lines or little bits that I would hear from characters and games. And, you know, I would repeat those to myself, you know, during those moments where you're just like having a bad day and you just hear like that little motivational line in your head. You're like, oh yes, like I feel so much better. Um, and later on in life, I went on to become an athlete. So I wrestled in high school and in college, um, but I would always like, I would think about, and this is funny going back to Final Fantasy X, before my matches, you know, I'd be bouncing on the sideline and I would always think of that scene of Final Fantasy X in the beginning when Titus is sitting in the water right before the big oh. game and he's like, getting ready to go out there and yeah that always go through my head before I'd go out in matches and I actually know it's pretty successful I, I wrestled at the D1 level and so had a good little sports career but that that memory of those lines and those stories that I would hear these voice actors portray always stuck with me and so a little bit later in life I was like why don't I give it a try because people would always tell me like oh my gosh I just love hearing you speak you're so charismatic so easy to listen to and I had a little bit of a stint in the public speaking sphere so I was an admissions counselor, um, then I also did a little bit of public speaking, I would do motivational speeches, that sort of thing, talk about athletics and my experience. And again, taking that experience and thinking, how can I do this and not have to be on the road all the time, right? Like, how can I get paid to talk for a living and not have to move a whole lot? Boom, voiceover. So then we fast forward to about, ooh, about two months ago, um, after recording demos and practicing and all that good stuff, I got signed up with an agency in Los Angeles. Um, so it was like, oh my gosh, dream come true, validation. And so now every day I'm getting these auditions, you know, from, from major brands. We're talking things like McDonald's and, and commercials for Old Spice and all sorts of these, these, these big major brands and then Hulu and Netflix and anything that you can think of, the things that are coming down my pipeline. And it's just so cool. I'm like, oh my gosh, like, I can't believe I even get to like read for this stuff. Like, that's such an honor. Um, and then mixed in there is obviously the character work and I can't talk about the, the character things that I get sent because all of that stuff is, is confidential but just sure. some of the things that I get to see I'm like oh my gosh that's so exciting I could be this character I could be that person in a game and then I could fill that role that you know these voice actors filled for me when I was a kid and I, I have dreams of you know sitting one day and some kid coming up to me and being like hey I, I heard your voice in a game and like I'm your big fan and you know you made me like feel better and I was having a bad day and I'm like oh my heart just wrenches so I look forward to being able to have that experience and and give back the way that games gave to me that little kid will maybe be me coming up to you at a convention <laughs> can you sign my statue please <laughs> So uh, that was like compared to what you told me about your your voice acting and history yesterday. That was like like some Lawrence of Arabia type epic scope <laughs> of stuff that you've gone through. Like that was like a small <laughs> tease you gave me yesterday. I didn't realize it was like yeah. that expansive where you're doing like motivational speaking and and about a athletics stuff. I think that's great. Uh, that's yeah. It was a, wow. It was a, it was an interesting sort of, of transition. I've ping ponged through a lot of different careers, and I really think I've, I've found the way in which I can use my voice most effectively. So it's, it's been a real real treat, and I'm just excited for the ride going forward. It's, it's rare. I'm actually quite jealous of you that you found a uh, like some kind of career that you have like a real passion for, and that's like, that's like your <laughs> drive. Because I have I haven't I, there's like a lot of people, including myself, that go through their entire lives and like never find that they they're just always wondering what their great passion is and that's i think that's wonderful that you found that this this early in your life i think i really I'm, I'm incredibly jealous of that <laughs> well i appreciate it it definitely means a lot and it's good to always have direction and purpose and drive and things that you're doing and i take that same kind of energy and i put it into like the petition with roddy out of stories yes um and so when that got started it was really one day i was kind of just sitting around and I was, I was on the uh, Reddit forums, so I was looking through, because um, every so often I would go online, I would just Google Radiata stories, and I'd go to the news and see if there was anything, right? And very rarely uh, is there anything, and I came across an article actually in 2017, uh, or rather it was written in 2017, but I came across it much later. Um, I probably read it in, I want to say it was around Thanksgiving 2019. Um, so I read this article, it was written um, by Chloe Spencer, a former intern at Kotaku, and she talked about how Roddy Out of Stories was her favorite game, and I was like, oh my goodness, someone else like knows what it is, like I'm not alone, I'm not crazy, like I didn't just fabricate this experience that I had. Um, 
And so I read this article and then, you know, the, the itch, it comes back and I start thinking to myself, like, okay, what can I do? Like, is there anything like news? Is there any like kind of game? Well, like, what can I find? And I start looking and I come across this subreddit and it's a Radiata Story subreddit. And at the time, I want to say it's got like 200 to 300 or so people in it. And they're all just super passionate fans. And they're, you, you hear the, the messages and you read through and it's like, I wish this game would come back. I wish there was some way to play it. And I was like, well, instead of us all just like sitting around talking about it, like, why don't we do something about it? And yeah. so then I, I come up with this idea of, okay, what can we do? I don't have Square Enix and Triace on speed dial. I can't just call them up, right? So I've got to do something to get their attention. So I come up with this idea to start a petition. And pretty much from there, I, I went to change. I got it all set up and I made a Twitter account for it so that I could be able to interact sort of with uh, fans and followers on a regular basis because one of the things that I saw when I was um, researching um, change petitions and what makes them successful was this guy wrote a whole piece about how his he updated people regularly he was kept in constant contact with the, the people that had signed it so that they always knew that it was still alive and it was still a thing and so I was like okay I've got to like really be on it and doing the marketing research of like what makes things viral? Like, what makes things popular? What makes people want to tune in and listen? And when you can have people have an emotional response to something, whether that's making people <laughs> really upset, or that's making people really happy, or that's making people laugh. Now, obviously, I'm not trying to make people upset. That's not really the one that I'm aiming for. <laughs> but I figure I can make people feel happy and I can make people laugh. And so when I wrote the sort of description of the, the petition, I really came at it from trying to hit that nostalgia button for folks of like, hey, remember when you were a kid and your parents were out or maybe you were staying up late on the weekends and you were just playing your favorite game? I had that feeling too and that was Radiata Stories for me. And I know that that resonates with a lot of people when they hear that or when they read that. So I was like, okay, boom, that's going to get them. And then going over to the, the consistent contact and the humor piece, going over to Twitter. I was like, I need to be making memes. I need to be, <laughs> I need to be funny. I need to be one of these accounts that is constantly generating traffic because if you see something funny on social media, even if you don't really know what it's in reference to, if you get the joke, you're somewhat inclined to send it to a buddy or retweet it or share it. And just that alone is enough for us to get more exposure. And again, I've kind of taken all these little marketing tidbits and applied them to the petition in hopes that it would be successful. And I had input from Chloe when I first started about, hey, like, what should we call this thing? You know, <laughs> I was like, I, do I just call it the Radiata Stories petition? And she was like, why don't you call it Revive Radiata Stories? And at first that's what I was gonna go with, but then the hashtag was like kind of long and it didn't always really like fit well when you try to like <laughs> make tweets about it. So then just cut it down to Revive Radiata. And I was like, ooh, that's got like a nice ring to it, like double yeah. R. and. So from there, that was the slogan, that was the campaign, and from that point, I would spend, you know, a couple hours every night. I would go to Twitter and I would hit search and I would type in Radiata Stories, and every single tweet on the platform, I would read through them, I would like them, I would comment on them. It actually was to the point where <laughs> I was commenting so much at the beginning uh, that I got a message from Twitter because they thought that I was a bot. <laughs> really? Were like, there's no, yeah, there's like, there's no way wow. that a human is like liking and commenting at this frequency. And I was like, no, no, like I'm, I'm a real yeah. person. I'm, I'm Clearly really. Clearly, Twitter just that doesn't in... understand its own users. If it really, <laughs> if they think just because somebody is commenting over and over, and I get that there's the algorithm, but it's like, mm, no, there are people out there that do that. That that aren't bots definitely <laughs> so it was, um, it was a fun little little hiccup in the beginning but again small road bump but it was a great great sort of like okay I, I feel amped up and I need to take this energy and drive it towards something mm -hmm. um, I guess we should provide some context as to like what Roddy Out of Stories actually is for those who are unfamiliar oh, sure. so in your in your own words what is Roddy Out of Stories Okay. Ooh. All right. It's like a challenge, like elevator pitch, right? Yes. Uh, so, <laughs> I would say, Radiata Stories is a a beautiful sort of tri ace work, and it's beautiful not in the sense that it's like, oh my gosh, this epic masterpiece that makes you feel and cry and takes you on this deep, deep emotional journey. Now you feel some of that, but it's beautiful in the sense that it combines humor with action with. Um, just all of the things that you would come to expect from a JRPG in such a way that is so relatable and so charming that it really feels like you are playing through a storybook 
Um, yes, tell exactly. Like, it, it, like Radiata stories, like stories is, is so on brand for what it feels like. It feels like when you are a little kid and your mom is reading you a bedtime story, you're like, I can't wait to see what happens next. And you giggle and you chuckle and you have fun and you build bonds with these characters and everything feels alive. Like when you're a little kid and your mom or your dad is reading you the three little pigs or, or little red riding hood you feel like you're in that world and radiata stories makes you feel that and it was so ahead of its time in the way that you know it had a day and night cycle and all of the characters in the town had schedules and personalities and you could follow them around and learn all these little like things about them it's almost wild to think about that something like that existed in the, the playstation 2 era because now you know we have games on PlayStation 4, Xbox One, Nintendo Switch that don't even have that kind of life in their world. Uh, and so for to have something that existed at that time was truly special and an experience that I, I hope everyone gets to play at some point in time. I think it literally opens with the storybook as well. I'm, I'm pretty <laughs> yeah. sure like when, when it goes to the opening flashback of the Karen fighting the water dragon, it literally opens with this beautiful storybook called Radiata Stories. And it's That's just right, the, the yeah. music just sweeps in, and it, you're ex- exactly right with it being the having the aura of a storybook kind of game, which I think I think that adds so much personality to the game. And, and it does this really. Oh, go, go on. So I was gonna say, um, do you have any like vivid memories of when you first played it? Yes, yes, I do. <laughs> I have several vivid memories of Radiata stories. Um, so one of the very uh, funny ones, and, and again, try to give some context to the game. Um, so you play as this character, his name's Jack Russell, um, his dad, and yes, that, that just is his real dog, name, his name's yeah. Jack Russell. <laughs> um, and his dad was this famous knight, and so you try out for the knights, and you know you try to follow in your dad's legacy uh, but essentially some things happen, and you're not in the knights anymore, um, but then you're sort of introduced to the larger scope which is the town of Radiata. And so you're in this immersive world and you're making these connections with people. And one of the things that's really interesting about the game is you can walk up and talk to someone and interact with them in that way, or you can walk up to someone and kick them in the shin. And you you can start off your first interaction with a shin kick. And so the kick feature is how Jack interacts with the whole world. He can kick treasure chests open instead of like bending over and and unlocking them. Uh, He can kick doors, he can kick boulders and and, and objects around the world to find little hidden things. And and he just does it so like nonchalantly. It's not like he like rears back and he's just like this emotional like robotic kick and it just makes you giggle like every time you see it. Um, but one of my first memories is coming out of Jack's house and again all the characters in the world have their own little schedule so I'm coming out of Jack's house and above his house there's like this little like overpass he kind of lives under a bridge like a troll (laughs) Um, but there's this this old guy his name's Fernando and so he's on the bridge and he's like punching and kicking and doing his morning routine and you know little middle school me is like oh I'm good at video games I'm gonna like kick this old guy and start a fight with him so you know I start a fight with him <laughs> it's like literally a, a two hit combo super move out of a fighting game and there's like a, a roaring uppercut and then I'm like dead and, like I've lost the fight and luckily when you pick fights with people in town it's not game over it's just you're down to one HP and you have to live with the shame of failing <laughs> and so that was my very first memory of like oh my gosh like this game is pretty like pretty merciless in, in terms of like you, you can pick fights with people but it doesn't mean that just because you're the main character that you're always going to win and, and I, I love just the way that I was able to interact with all the different people and have these little moments and one of the other ones I would say that, that stands out to me um, is when you first go to um, or when you first join the knights there is this scene where uh, after Jack um, finishes the night selection trials. He gets shown his room, and so he comes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and so he comes down to his room and opens the door, and he looks and he's like, "Oh my gosh!" Like, like what? And he was like, um, "You know, this has to be some kind of mistake." Um, and then uh, this guy comes out, and he's like, "Oh my gosh!" Like this is like your room, right? Like I knew someone else already lived here. And he's like, oh no, like this is gonna be like your roommate. And then Jack, like complete seriousness, like leans back and does this like complete on death whale where he's like, no! <laughs> and it, it's just, it's so funny. And it, it's such a cut from sort of like the the, the seriousness of the moment. And I, I remember laughing so hard watching that as, as a kid and thinking, this is going to be a really fun ride. Like, I am going to enjoy this game. Like, even if the combat would have been completely awful, which it's not, but even if it would have been awful and even if the story would have been really short, I was like, I know that I'm going to have some laughs playing through this story. I think what makes that scene, that, that moment 
great uh, when Jack does the the the, the nose when uh, Leonard <laughs> just just immediately just deadpans just stares at him is like when you're done with the death whales come in and get changed and then he just walks inside i think that that line just sells the joke 100 percent. absolutely because it's how you feel like you're like <laughs> you're like oh okay and then we're just whoop, we're just gonna go on yeah. with the story like nothing happened see i was exposed to it via game informer and i usually i usually take a massive dump all over traditional games media these days but I got handed if it wasn't for Game Informer back in the 2004 2005 era, I never would have discovered this game at all. And uh, when I finally got around to buying it, I remember sneaking a peek of the opening cutscene with the, the, the flashback to your father fighting a dragon. And I was hooked because I wasn't allowed to play video games on the weekdays, but I managed to sneak a peek of it before going to school one day. And I was like, I, I need to keep playing this. This looks this looks awesome. <laughs> so I spent that whole weekend playing it. And the moment that it won me over, uh, aside from, you know, it was f very funny. It was beautiful. Had a, a great, still today has, has a timeless art style. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the soundtrack is, is a masterpiece, I think. What won me over is the the day and night cycle because I can vividly mm. remember. I think it was either going to Earth Valley or the City of Flowers. I think it might have been the City of Flowers when you're passing over this bridge, and I remember seeing the the clock running down to um, the time where it would finally switch from day to night. And I remember just like stopping on this bridge and staring in the background at Radiata Castle in the horizon and just the sun lit over it like like it's about to set. And I was just transfixed by that image. And I, I, I'm i pretty sure at the time I had played games with day and night cycles, but I never seen one done in this kind of like the, the art in a way where it just literally yeah. looked like like a picture out of a storybook where it, and it but it was alive and the sun mm -hmm. would just set gently over Radiata City and the horizon and then the moon just like gradually appears and the sun just just slowly but surely changes into night and I thought that was just one of the most beautiful things I have ever seen in a game and it was done just completely seamless no need for mm -hmm polygons or teraflops or <laughs> 120 frames per second or 8k ultra resolution it was just simplistic 480p graphics back in the day and it was stunning it, it just blew it blew me away literally just like blew my mind as a as a as a, a 12 year old playing it um and from it's that point on i was just i was hooked i just i just fell head over here heels in love with it from that point forward it's one of the only games I can think of where you can literally just take, pick a spot like in the world or, yeah. or in the town, right? Mm -hmm. And you can just put your controller down and just watch. You can just watch people walk past. You can watch the, the day change. And you feel like you're in Like the world doesn't stop just because you're not moving. And that's one of the things that I love. It's like, oh, my gosh, this is a real le living, breathing world. Yeah. It happens whether I interact with it or not. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like it's amazing that even games that have such impressive graphics can't nail that that feeling of familiarity with one's environment and that's why i love i love um that's why i'm, I'm i love open world games and i'm a bit dubious of them because when done badly it can come across as just this empty space that there's this that's the selling point mm. it's just raw square footage but <laughs> when you take a game like radio stories that's kind of semi open world i don't know if i'd say full open world because you're on a very narrow pathway but for sure it gives off this illusion of feeling larger than it actually is and that's what i love about video games like of its kind where because you are limited the game has to put in more effort to sell you that this is a, a living breathing place and i think writing out of stories does that almost flawlessly aside from <laughs> the occasional animation hitch here and there and i, I rarely have ever seen those in my time i've seen them but very rarely and and it just it just feels alive and it just feels like a, like a home away from home of sorts and it's like every time you keep revisiting the same locations and the the music just keeps queuing in right on right on point and it just it, it's like returning to a real place when you play that mm. video game and i think those are the best kind of video games where 
you grow this sense of intimacy with your environment. And running out of storage just is, a, I think, is a master class. I think, I think any developer setting out to make a game of this kind should be forced to play Radio Stories and have somebody repeatedly point to the screen and go, this is how you do it. If you cannot match, I don't care how many frame, how many frames per second you have, I don't care what resolution you have, I don't care how many teraflops you have, if you cannot match this in terms of intimacy, don't bother. Just don't. And that was, that was made like 15 years ago. One of the things that I was thinking about as you, you were speaking is, Right Out of Stories is one of the games because I hear this phrase tossed around a lot when you hear about like games like um, what's an example like Fallout for example. Mm -hmm. um, they talk about environmental storytelling. Right Out of Stories nails environmental storytelling. Absolutely, yeah. And, and it does this really neat thing. A lot of times, like you're talking about, some of the paths aren't fully open world, where it puts things in the background that are just out of sight. That's like they're like moving and they're doing things. It's like you see an animal run behind a bush, or you'll see someone dive over a bridge that you can't access, and your brain is like, "I want to know. Like, I want to know what's back there. Like, what is going on? Like, what is the story?" And it it keeps you asking those questions and, and keeps your your engagement. It's one of the games where, if you play through Radiata Stories, I would say in its entirety, you know, do all the the bonus stuff which is some really cool bonus stuff, by the way. We're talking, you know, an 80 to 90 hour experience, and you do not feel a sec, like, it flies by. <laughs> yeah. Especially if it, and it has replayability, because halfway through the game, you're forced to make this really crucial decision, and you can go back and replay it again to try to see what happens in the, the second half of the game that you didn't go with the first time. And I, I, I don't think, I can't really think of any games that are such like massive departures in their in their second halves like that where you're just completely no. <laughs> locked out of certain environments you miss out on characters i just i honestly i'm struggling to think of a game that does that like that extensively like radiata stories does yeah the only games i can think of are, are, are sort of games again maybe like going back to that fallout example where you have to pick a faction right mm -hmm. and you have to side with them but Those even then the you can games. access areas like even if you're not in that faction you can go to other cities like once you're once you're locked to the human side or the non-human side like that's it like like you can't go yeah. back to roddy out of cities you can't go back to force metropolis you can't go to goblin haven it's it's and, and, and it, because of that, it's like there's such a weight to that decision that you have to make halfway through the game because you've grown to love being in certain environments, but there's that conflict with where you feel as far as where you want the story to go. And I think that's that's terrific. That's that's terrific weighty storytelling in that respect because there's actual consequences of locking you out of places that you like and characters that you like. It's great. <laughs> One of the things that I, I was just thinking about, I'm so curious, and if anyone's, you know, when they're listening back to this, plays Roddy Out of Stories, please test this for me, because I've always been curious about this. I've always wondered, right, like, because you always have human friends first before you make the split, because you're a human. Mm -hmm. um, I've always wondered, if you level up one of your human characters to a really high level, and then fight them after picking the non-human side, I've always wondered if they retain their level and stats. They don't, unfortunately. Oh, dang. Yeah. That would have been a nice little touch, I feel like. That would have, oh man, that would have been hell at the end of the game when you're fighting <laughs> Gerald and the, and the the, the non-human side. I wouldn't even have made it to the the city of White Knights. Uh, so I guess my next question would be, if you had to pick one reason, like like wrap it all up into one reason why Roddy Out of Stories is so personally significant for you, what would it be? Hmm. Um. I would say, for me, it, it kind of goes to that point where you were talking about the weight of choice. Mm -hmm. You know, it was the first time that I ever played a game where the story wasn't completely preordained for me, and it gave me that sense of choice um, and having to live with the decision. And when you're in middle school, like, you don't really think about the ramifications of your actions. You're just like, whatever, like, <laughs> you know, I'm young, I'm going to do what I want. And so having a game that made me feel this feeling, you know, it really sat with me, it really sunk with me, and believe it or not, it actually started to make me think more about the decisions that I made in my life. Like every time I would like have to make what I would feel like was a big decision, it felt like the world would literally freeze and it'd be like, okay, option A or option B, what will you choose? <laughs> uh, I think if I were to go with the reason, because uh, it would probably have to be that this game taught me that video games can be works of art and taken seriously mm. as works of art. Like people talk about how 
you know, like the game that brought them around during their childhood to like the lifelong passion for it would be um, maybe like Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time or Metal Gear Solid or um, maybe Chrono Trigger, Final Fantasy, something like that. This was my Legend of Zelda growing up. This was the mm. one that like really pushed me into going from, hey, video games are fun as like a little kid to like, this needs to be taken seriously as an art form and promotes a like like I love that. 100%. This Radio Out of Stories is the one. And it, and again, it, like it saddens me that a game that that is this personally significant to me just does not get the love it deserves from its publisher, from mass audience, from from whoever. <laughs> um and going back to your your campaign, um we talked yesterday a little bit just to kind of break the ice and I think one of the things that most that interests me the most what you brought up is that um there has to be an uh, like a fascinating story as to the making of this game somewhere out there and yeah all, all it takes is somebody finding it and co like co corroborating it and bring it all together and i think you would it, like because there is a history like you said that the voice actors of this game do remember these roles and i just i i, I think there is such a fascinating story about radiata stories out there and yet i just don't think it's been told it's like it's like a lost mystery or something <laughs> Yeah, it's really interesting in that way. And you know, going back to the piece about the cast, like this week on social media, you know, doing a lot of posting about the cast and the crew and more of that, like uh, the music and the voice actors and those sorts of things. But if I there's for those of the those of you that are listening that are, are big voiceover fans, you know, I'm gonna say some of these names and they're gonna register immediately in your head. Like when I say like Yuri Lowenthal, like that is the voice of Spider-Man from the current PlayStation 4 game. That is Ben 10. That is Sasuke from Naruto. Um, Bryce Pappenbrook, you know, he is Z Zidane Tribal from Final Fantasy IX. Uh, he's Kirito from Sword Art Online. Like these people were at the very beginning of their career when Radiata Star Stories was created and recorded and so what we're talking about here is, is this really amazing situation where some of the most talented people sort of in the entertainment industry were all on this one game at, at one place. Like that's the, that to me is such an interesting coincidence and that alone is a story within itself. But then, you know, you, you talk more about like um, sort of the cast and um, Bryce, for example, like he um, acted opposite of his dad in that game and that was one of the last things that they ever worked on together and so it's very special to Bryce in that way and so there's these little stories and these offshoots or um, talking about kind of maybe um, the the idea of like why should we make Radiata stories you know what was Tri Ace aiming for what were they looking for were they trying to depart from Star Ocean because there's a lots of little little pieces and nods to Star Ocean in Radiata stories Again, I don't know the answer to that, but that's one of the things I would love to know. I'm like, why is there so much <laughs> like Star Ocean and little Valkyrie profile things added into Radiata stories? Like, how many members of that team worked on this game? And again, I want to know that story. I want to hear more about it. And I feel like if this game, if Radiata stories got more attention, we would get more of those stories and more of those details. And the more you hear the story of the game, the more you fall in love with the, the, the actual storyline of the game, um, it becomes really just this story in actuality, but also in conception. It's just, a, it's like a story on story on story. It's, it's just like when you, cause if it weren't for your account, like your, the, the petition, I wouldn't have known some of these little bits about writing out of stories. Like I've done my research over the years. And even then they're like things that you told me, like either like, like a speaking or through the account, it's like it's like oh my god I never noticed that like I never knew that the voice actor or actors for Jack and Parsec were father and son I never knew that mm -hmm. the voice of Spider-Man from the current PS4 game was the voice of Daniel it's just little things like that just fascinate me and yeah I, I I'm sure there are more secrets out there like maybe not necessarily secrets but just little bits of trivia out there that would make a fascinating story if brought together under the right context that's the goal. That's the game plan. Yeah. That's what I'm aiming for. Um, because, again, the more we can tell that story, the more we get people leaning in. Because they recognize these names. They recognize these brands. They hear Square Enix. They hear Tri-Ace. People know what those things are if they mm -hmm. play JRPGs. And they're like, oh, I never played a game that was made by two companies that I, I'm very fond of their products. Like, how did I miss that one? And, again, it, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, but marketing. Variety out of stories. I do not feel God. It's it's just <laughs> do. No, it um, did when not. When it comes to 
when it comes to marketing, I, I feel like I only ever saw one trailer. I never saw a commercial on TV. Um, and it was one of those things that I found the game by happenstance. My mom just pointed out at the store and was like, I thought this was something that you'd like to play. And she brought it home and I played it and fell in love with it. But again, it was an accident. I just happened upon it. And I feel like if Roddy Auto Stories got that opportunity and got that push today, the humor and the charm would rope people in and we would all be scratching our heads like, how did we miss this the first time? Uh, as far as revive Radiata as well, um, what is your what are like some of your dream end goals as far as the petition itself and the campaign that you've been championing for? How long has it been now? I feel like it's been like almost a good year since since yeah, you started. Yeah, it's, uh, it's at the seven month mark. Okay, um, so it's yeah seven months now. So a couple more months and we'll be at a year. And so for me, I would say big end goals, obviously. Um, I want Roddy Auto Stories re-released. Originally, <laughs> I think very selfishly, I was kind of just like, oh, let's bring it back on the PlayStation Store, you know, not thinking about how much gaming has spread and how fans have so many more consoles. Because I feel like when I was a kid, it was very uncommon to be in a multi-console house. Like, you had, like, mm -hmm. one thing. Same here. Um, but people now, yeah, they have, like, every system. And so I think about seeing it on the Switch, seeing it on PlayStation 4 or or five, or because that's coming out soon. Seeing it on Xbox, you know, I want to see it on all platforms. Seeing it on Steam, um, yeah, Persona hell. Four Golden, yeah, is like trending amazingly right now on PC. I think Roddy Auto Stories could do just as well, right? Well, maybe yeah. not just as well. We're talking about Persona here, but I think it could do incredibly well on, on PC. Um, and so my goal is obviously first step that re-release, and then if we're talking, you know, pie in the sky here, I'm hoping that that re-release. Um, and whether it's it's upscaled digitally or just slapped straight back um, online as it was originally created, I think it'll still do fine. Um, but I, I want that re-release so people have the opportunity to play it, bring in the new fans, and then from there, my, my hope is that Try Ace and Square Enix see how much love there is for this franchise, and they give it a second go. They give it a second go with like new vision and, and, and full focus, you know, because I would love to see what a remake could look like with with full attention with this like okay this is not just a little side project like this is something that people want and to see them put their full effort into it not saying that they didn't put their full effort into it to the first time but again I, I've mentioned this point before but <laughs> we're talking about a release window right out of stories came out within a year of Kingdom Hearts 2 Dragon Quest 8 and Final Fantasy 12 I don't know anyone that can name a JRPG for me that could be successful in that release window um, and so for Roddy Auto Stories to even do remotely as well as it did we're talking about a game that almost sold half a million copies um, so for Roddy Auto Stories to do that well in that release window says a lot about what it was um, and to, to have a second chance to do that when it's not competing against all of these JRPGs from the same publisher uh, under the, the pretext that it's going to be a remake I think people would love it I think people would dig it I would love to see the cast come back and reprise these roles because again They've had over 15 years of getting better at voice acting. I would love to hear what kind of <laughs> reads that they would give and how those lines would sound and, and how great that thing would be. And so for me, first step, re-release, ultimate goal is a remake and just uh, bring Roddy Auto Stories back into pop culture. Yeah, because that, that's that's an interesting point that you make that these voice actors are going to be much, they will have honed their craft so much by now that uh, maybe not necessarily playing the same ages of their characters, but they could play them like, like, 15 20 years down the road we got to, well we'd have to make one of the we'd obviously have to make one of the endings canon and <laughs> so um <laughs> yeah, there'd be some the route. yeah there'd be some complications there but i'm i think they could probably do it i mean even if maybe maybe i'll, I'll go even further maybe not even have the same characters just a different story set like a thousand years later in this world or something i think that would be really interesting to see like keep the same tone the same vibe but just maybe have it to where a new situation with the dragons or the cosmos is happening some something like that i don't know but yeah that's not a bad plan i think i think um because i used to embarrassingly like I've, i never write fan fiction all that much but i i used to write <laughs> fan fiction of radio stories when i was in high school and i think one of the one of the not pitches not like i was going to try and being like i think you should make this game but like it was a little a project of mine like writing a fan fiction it was years later and because ridley did not fulfill her part as the vessel that role has been trans has been passed on to the um, 
her and Jack's child, and then they Ooh. have to deal with that or something like that, or maybe grandchild. Maybe grandchild might be better. I'd love to see an old Jack. I'd love to see <laughs> Jack as an old man, like the same age as like Fernando or the um, the one. Oh God, I can never pronounce his name. The one hobo guy in Radiata City. Zeranium. Uh, Yes, him. So, like, the same age as that. Uh, maybe a little bit more, a lot more wiser, but mm, yeah. still the but he, same. He'd still have his, his personality quirks, I'm sure. Yeah. Because even then, like, I think, I think, um, kind of steering off into a different topic, I think that's why I love Radio House Stories as well so much, because Jack really goes through changes in this game. He's not the same character at all, regardless of what ending you get. He's a lot more mature and world weary after either of those endings. And Absolutely. to see his journey go from this like bratty, selfish, annoying kid to this confident, strong adult, uh, mature, mature of sorts, adult, <laughs> is really fascinating to watch. Um, where I feel like so many video game characters throughout a series, they're just stuck in one mode or one kind of personality. This is a character that throughout this entire game just it's it's like it harkens back to the old jrpgs of old where these characters really go on a journey and they learn and they they learn things and they change and i think that's that's great i miss i miss rpgs like that where it's these characters that start out young and immature and they grow into these confident adults i really like that and it's, it's a parallel for anyone who grew up around that time especially like reaching like the teenage years like i was you could see mm -hmm. it where it's a parallel between Jack's growth as a, into an adult versus like my own or someone else that plays it. I think again that adds a, such a personal significance to running out of stories for not just me but for a lot of other people. And kind of on that point, one of the things I think about is, <laughs> and I don't know if the game is doing this on purpose, but you think about Jack's progression right at the beginning. You're talking about he's bratty, he's very arrogant, and that arrogance morphs into true confidence towards the end of the game. But what's also mm -hmm. interesting about that is when Jack is very arrogant and bratty at the beginning, the kinds of characters that you can recruit to your party are very weak. They're not very powerful. Yeah. And as Jack grows as a person, he's actually able to form bonds with stronger party members. And so it's, it's almost kind of this, this interesting little lesson of like, hey, as you grow and develop and become a better person in life, you'll actually make better, higher quality bonds with people. So it's, it incentivizes you to be a better person, yeah. um, whether you... Whether that's like a slap in the face, like, hey, here's a life lesson, or just a little thing that you pick up through playing it. Uh, a couple more questions before we move on to the, the fan questions. Um, sure, sure. You collaborated with, um, I don't know how to pronounce this, um, um, Chipoli? Is that how you pronounce the, the I, artist? No, I'm not enti okay. <laughs> entirely sure either. So um, I, apologize I, I, I apologize if the artist is listening to this. I'm, I'm probably going to butcher <laughs> your name, but uh, your Twitter handle, but... Uh, Chep Chepoli or Chipoli? I'm gonna choose Chepoli just to be safe. Yeah, that's a good. I thought like that's a safe guess, and I think her actual name is Mai, um, okay. based on just what I've, I've seen via the emails. Um, so again, but Chepoli is probably a good one, or we can say Chep. We can't Chep. get wrong with Chep, right? Okay. <laughs> Chep, Chep sounds good. So you collaborated with Chep to create original art, which I think is great. How did that come to be? Yeah, yeah. So um, I had been having this vision for a while of okay, what's the next phase of Revive Radiata? You know, I'm making memes. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I'm making these little posts, I'm, I'm sharing these history facts, but okay, I need something that is going to be appealing to people outside of the Radiata fandom. That was my goal. So I wanted to transition into to video and original content. Things that if you saw, and even if you didn't know what Radiata Stories was, that you would objectively be like, oh, that's cool. What is that thing? I want to learn more. Mm -hmm. um, and so I spent the whole day, you know, I put out a cast on Twitter like, hey, I am looking for um, an artist to do an original commission. and um, so, you know, I, I spent the whole day DMing back and forth with various artists. Um, I saw Chep, she did this really awesome piece um, for, uh, oh gosh, what was it? Golden Sun. That's what it was. It was for Golden Sun and the characters. And I just mm. love the way that she drew them. And then I also saw that she did a little sketch of Tifa and Aerith uh, for the Final Fantasy VII remake. And I was like, oh my gosh, she is so good at capturing the energy of these characters. And I was like, I feel like this is someone who can do Jack and Ridley justice. And so reached out, we got it put together. And it was funny when I reached out, um, the re first response I got was, hey, just so you know, I only take commissions on like a case by case basis. So depending on what your idea is, I might not do it if I don't find it interesting enough. And so I was like, oh gosh, like <laughs> fingers mm. crossed. Uh, and so I send it and immediately, it, it speaks to the power of Radiata Stories. I send it 
she does a little bit of research, watches some clips on YouTube, and is like, I'm in love with these characters. I want to make more Radiata story stuff. Like, I would be happy to make this and wow. anything else that you need. Like, I am a fan of this game. Um, and I was like, wow. So that just goes to show that when people get exposed to Radiata stories, it's like, it's I don't know. It's just, it, it sucks you in. And, it's infectious. Yeah, infectious and sucks you in in such a way. And so um, we got the commission done. And my vision was I wanted to create a cover um, that was a true to form of the original kind of cover of the box art, um, but showed what kind of Radiata stories could look like maybe in a modern age um, with, with a, a different bit of a flair to it. Um, and so mm. um, that was kind of what we were looking for, and, and she did a great job of, of drawing it in this very, I feel like, modernized art style that also captured some of that fairy tale-esque look to it. Um, and for anyone that's listening at home, I encourage you to check out Chep uh, on her social media or head over to Revive Radiata um, on our page. If you scroll through, it's very easy. You can find the, the full print. Um, and it's, it's beautiful to look at. And it's just so great. And it, it's some really solid art. And the idea was it would look so good that people who didn't know anything about Radiata stories would say, that's good art. What is this? And then boom. And from the time, and this is an interesting little tidbit, so from the time that that was released, when it first came out, we had just crossed like the 1500 signature mark. Within a month mm. of that coming out, we just crossed the 2000 signature mark. So um, we gained about 500 supporters just from the, the influx of, of eyeballs that we got from that commission. So it was absolutely worth every penny. And do you have, can you tease any future collaborations with her, maybe? <laughs> um, so I've got some ideas that I haven't talked to her necessarily about yet, but sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's some of the things that I'm kicking around in my head. Um, I think it would be really cool um, to sell prints of, of the piece, but also looking at maybe getting something, if, if it's not that design, but maybe a different design for like t-shirts. Um, and uh, this isn't something that Chep necessarily does, um, but I'm looking potentially in the, the next couple of months or weeks um, to work with someone who can either do kind of like um, sort of like plastic figurines or like plush dolls. Ooh. Mm. Oh, oh, man, I kill for a Jack Russell plush doll. <laughs> so that's the that's the that's the, the far future. Um, again, trying to just create as much cool marketing. Because my other idea is that I want to do such a good job of marketing Radiata stories that if Square and Tri-Ace decide, okay, we're gonna bring this back. There is already like the stuff has already been done for you. Like <laughs> all you gotta do is release the game. I've done all the marketing work for yeah. you. You're done. Just <laughs> put it out. <laughs> Trying to create as low of a barrier to entry as possible. You'll get so much props when like it, when they because I hope I really hope they do. I don't like to say if instead of when, but uh, so I'll be I'll be optimistic to say when they finally do it. I I. I will be the first one to like congratulate you and like yes, thank you, thank you so much for for doing this. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. Um, yeah. And before we move on to the fan questions, I got one more. So this is a, this is more of a personal thing. So what are some of your all-time favorite games? Like if you had to pick three, let's say three. Ooh, e e excluding Radiata stories or including Radiata stories? Uh, ex excluding. Okay, of okay. Course. <laughs> I was like, oh, because there's one off the top right there. Um, hmm. I'm definitely gonna give it to Final Fantasy X. Um, now these are in no particular order. Um, I'm just gonna say these are these are my my top favorites. Um, Final Fantasy X, I would say, is probably one of my favorite games of all time. Uh, and then I'm trying to think of games that I've like poured because I've I've played so many video games. <laughs> oh, this is a toughie top three. Um, and then probably second to that for me, um, I'm gonna have to go with Persona Three. Um, yeah, I would say Persona 3 is probably that, that number two, because when I finished that game, I was like, oh, I'm changed as a person. <laughs> like, it really left a, a, a deep impact on me. And then the third one... I've never played Persona 3, so I, I would love to play it one of these days. Oh, you are. It is a treat. It is a good time. A 10 out of 10 recommend. Um, and then the last... I didn't go into that franchise until 5, and 5 just, like, blew me away oh, yeah. to the point where I, I was like, okay, all right, I need to play these other ones. Yeah, Persona 5 is in a league of its own, for sure. Um, and then, um, number three for me is, it's more of a, a, a personal, I mean, it's all personal, this is personal, 
um, but it might, I guess, be a surprise for some people, um, is Digimon Story Cyber Sleuth, um, which came out on the PlayStation mm. 4, I want to say about 2017. The reason why that one is so important to me, and it kind of ties into this petition, um, but when I was a kid, and, and even now, you know, into adulthood, I'm a huge Digimon fan. Um, but when I was a kid, I always loved Digimon, but I was always like, it was like you go to lunch and you talk about Digimon, and everyone's like, oh, this is a Pokemon table, man. We don't talk about Digimon over here. Um, so I was like this outskirt, like, oh, man, I wish other people liked Digimon the way that I do. It's, it's kind of funny because it's sort of like with Radiata stories. I like these hidden sort of off-to-the-side kind of things. But Digimon is a pretty well-recognized brand. Um, but when I was a kid, Digimon the movie came out in the United States. And I begged my mom, I was like, please, can we go, can we go see this movie, can we go see this movie? Um, and she was eventually like, yes. And so me, my mom, and dad, we went. And it was the first time ever in my entire life that when I asked to go see a movie, like I suggested it, that my parents took me. So it was the first time that I was like, oh, they like listened to my ideas. And so it was a good movie and I had this positive experience. But then um, moving on, you know, like a decade or so later, uh, Digimon games are doing pretty well in the United States. The TV show is doing well. But then they start to plummet. And because of that, they start pulling Digimon games kind of off the shelf. They stop selling them and distributing them um, in the U.S. and in other territories outside of Japan because they're just like, well, there's not a market there anymore. But there absolutely was. And so this group comes together. They call themselves Operation Decode. And they get all these international fans to come together and talk about their love of Digimon. They start a petition. And the petition, to my knowledge, is probably the most successful video game petition of, of all time in that it it was actually directly cited by Bandai Namco and say, like the, the, the director of the game um, saying that this petition played a part in why we are releasing these games in the United States. Um, and so you had that validation that petitions can work. And so when Cyber Sleuth came out, you know, I was like, I gotta buy this game because I wanna show them like, hey, I want Digimon games to be continued to sold um, in the United States. And the game was a, 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 such a fun experience. And as a Digimon fan, it, it's so many cool nods. And it's, it's very like straightforward turn-based RPG gameplay, but it's just done in such a way that's so fun. And when you hadn't seen a property like that in almost a decade, you were just pumped that it was even like back, you know? <laughs> and so then when you add the fact that it's a pretty good game on top of there, it's like, ooh. So I would say that's my number three um, because of its impact on me personally, but then also giving me that hope that petitions can work for Radiata Stories. I guess if I were to pick my three off the top of my head, it would it would be I, I'll go with Persona Five just because Persona Five is amazing. Excellent. Uh, I'll, I'll throw out NBA Street Volume Two. Oh. It's got nothing to do with JRPGs, <laughs> but but I love NBA Street Volume Two and Kingdom Hearts Two, which is more than likely my favorite game ever. Oh, dude, uh, that's a t yeah. I think Kingdom Hearts Two is probably a solid number four for me. Hmm. I could I could make like I could probably like talk about the game for hours on end and not get tired of it because I think there's just so much depth and personal significance to it. It's just, I love that game so much. I, I make a habit of, of playing it every year. Like like I make it an annual thing to like complete a playthrough of it every year. One thing I'll, I've done so since I was 13. One thing I'll say that'll probably make you chuckle is I think I'm probably in the minority, <laughs> but Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories is like one of my top three as, as Kingdom Hearts games. I, I'm like in the small population that's like, that's one of my favorite entries in the series. Hmm. It's it's one of my that's one of my favorite stories in the series. That's, but that's what it gameplay, is. I, I'm not a card guy, so I just... I, I'd like it if they remade it with the the action combat of two, and I, I could probably get into it. Yeah. And just be like, yeah, this is this is great. Oh but yeah, just the card stuff. Uh, it's an acquired taste. Yes, definitely. absolutely. I know. As I said, small minority there. <laughs> uh, fan questions. So earlier, um, yesterday, I threw up a tweet asking for fan questions, and we got quite a few, which was really cool. So the first one I'm going to ask is uh, is Clive just playing the fool or is he really that stupid <laughs> um, I think he really is that dumb yes I, I'll be honest <laughs> yeah I think that is definitely true to Clive but I also think that Clive strikes this kind of um, balance of like Goofy in Kingdom Hearts where Goofy's not like really dumb like Clive is definitely yeah. more dumb than Goofy um, but they're both yeah the really aware characters like they're always the ones that spot the little details that no one else notices <laughs> and mm -hmm. so like in the, the instance when they get ambushed by the Globlins like Clive was like oh I knew they were there the whole time and they're like why didn't you say anything again aware but also kind of stupid <laughs> the third one's here <laughs> uh, but I really I like Clive as a um, 
N not necessarily as a party member, but as a character, I, I like him. Cause, and I like that he's the first one that you get when you join Theater Vancor. I like that he actually goes there and is like, it's like, hey, I signed up. Yeah. Um, you recruit me now. And it's like, oh, oh, okay. True friend. That makes him a little bit more endearing than he would be if he was just the dumb one. Well, you know, it's funny. I think, I I'm sure more people than I have done this, but my very first playthrough, I kept Clive and my party the entire way, all the way to the final boss. Because <laughs> I was like, he, really? he was there for me when I needed him most. So I like felt this personal attachment to him. How, 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 like, how far did you level him up? Do you think? Um, I would say by the time I was fighting the the final boss, Clive was probably like level seventy, level eighty. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, another question we got, and this one I really like, is why does Elwyn side with the humans in the end? Um, so for for context, Elwyn is the leader of this the the warrior guild that Jack joins after being fired from the Royal Knights. And Elwyn, uh, this is another, we're going to get into this uh, another question later that has to do with Elwyn, but um, for me at least, like, Elwyn I think is one of the best characters in the game. And she's like, she has this, like, such a mysterious aura to her. Mm -hmm. And, but she's like, she strikes me as, like, the, with, with, like, the, the incredible voice acting and the writing. She is somebody that I, I completely understand if, if an army would follow her into battle. Because she has that leadership, like, aura to her. And one of the things which I think, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, one of the things I was going to say about Elwyn is, you know, when we talk about um, diversity in, in gaming and, and, and different kinds of leads, Elwyn, for me, was the first ever powerful female lead I'd ever seen in a video game. And it was done in a way where she wasn't hypersexualized or anything like that. She was just pure badassery. And again, when we talk about looking for examples of things, you want to talk about a strong female lead, Elwyn is the place to start. Yeah. 100%. And, like, I think, like, she she never removes her helmet throughout the whole game, but <laughs> in in the strategy guide, there is a picture of her without her helmet, and she's quite beautiful. Yeah, you gotta so rec like, recruit her to find out the truth. <laughs> yeah. So huh. it's like, oh, okay. But she, I, like, I love her interactions with Jack. Um, sorry, going back to the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why did she side with humans in the end? I It's duty. Mm. 100%. And that's that's what makes her such an interesting character is that no matter her personal feelings, and she does kind of side with her personal feelings in the end by letting Jack live, yeah, and not crush him to a million pieces <laughs> at the, the Death Mountain. Um, it's it's just like oh okay, great, awesome. She she's a she actually has a sense of duty, which just makes her admirable. 100% yeah duty and loyalty right like I think about yes um, she has a hundred percent buy-in from the people of theater Van Cor, and I don't think that she would ever betray that loyalty even if she disagreed no. with the cause I think that betraying her followers would hurt her too much for her to side with the non-humans she uh, like like it's so weird like seeing all these characters in theater Van Cor that are like just such, such hard asses and then and then, and then when they, when they're around Elwyn, they're like, "Oh, uh, hey, Chief. like like <laughs> Gerald, just completely just is like, like turns into like this little like meek little person around Elwyn. Have you, especially when he's embarrassed that when when she knocks on the door when he's in the the infirmary and he's like, "It's not the toilet, the door's <laughs> open," and he's like, oh, "Oh, sorry, I didn't know you were there." Have you read the little sign that's in Theater Van Cor that's like by Thanos' desk? It's Gerald's, Gerald's <laughs> Rules. Yes. I, yes. Yeah. I, I think that really encapsulates the whole idea when he's like, if Chief Elwin points at a pile of crap, you tell her it's beautiful. Like, we yeah. <laughs> we worship this woman. So, um, yeah. So, I, yeah. I would say that would be my answer about why she chooses the side the way that she does. And I think I, I think I said Death Mountain. I meant Fire Mountain. <laughs> Death Mountain, I was thinking Legend of Zelda. Um <laughs> And second, the third question: What is the deal with Radian? Which, that one, I, I literally like. My answer to that would just be the, the emoji of like the shrugged shoulders, like. Oh, oh. <laughs> um, again, for context, um, the the late game, the, the late game dungeon, you go through as Jack, has a boss named Radian, who is basically like this paper dragon thing who is very self-aware that he's in a game because after he gets beaten, he says, why wasn't I the main character of this game? And then he just <laughs> flings away. So I don't know what the deal with Radian was. That was just strange. So my theory, here's my theory with Radian. 
So when, okay. when you are going through the, the, the final dungeon, you, you fight mm -hmm. these four elemental dragons, right? Radian mm -hmm. doesn't appear until you have defeated all of them. And if you look at Radian, what you'll notice is he's got different color spots on him, one representing each color of the different dragons. And so I think that Radian is actually kind of like the primordial goo, because you know he's so simple. He's like a little paper cutout. Like I think he is the origin. Like I think when all the dragons go back into sleep mode, that's what they start as, and then he sort of kind of morphs and falls and breaks off into the complete forms of the various dragons. That's my theory. Hmm. That's okay. That's interesting. I would never have thought of that. Because to me, like, like Dragon Lair Cave is just like, oh, I get to fight all these dragons. <laughs> and then I see Radiant, I'm like, what? <laughs> and, but he hits hard, too, for a paper dragon. Oh, my God. Wow, he hits hard. Well, you think of that like uh, if, it, if the theory holds true, if he's the combination of all four of their powers, it would make sense that he yeah. would be so strong. Yeah, he's just such a goofy character, which is just so strange to see in a in a late game dungeon. It's just, but, just like like I've never seen something that was just so self aware <laughs> at that late into the game. That's just like 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 oh I'm, I'm in a video game. Whoa. It's like, okay. And that's okay. That is textbook radiata stories. We're always gonna mm -hmm. find a way to make it fun. Yeah, even even the big, tough. Um, uh, oh, what is his name? Uh, the 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 strong man looking guy. Gabriel. And then Jack looks down. And he's wearing like tidy whities on. <laughs> yes, that is probably one of the funniest scenes in all of gaming. I, I feel yeah. like for sure. And it's a it's a tough as nails boss that it's in, which they, they still found a way to keep within the spirit of Radiata storage. It's, it, that's that's great. Well, one of the things I also think is funny about that specific boss battle is it po it pokes fun at every other video game where these characters wear these ridiculous outfits and no one ever makes a comment about it. <laughs> like no one ever says anything about people basically walking around in dental floss. And Jack is like, yeah. "What is this? Like, I'm not fighting that guy." <laughs> He's he's like the the mockery of the distortion corridor. <laughs> uh, next question: Who are your who are our favorite characters in the game? Ooh, okay, all right. You set it off. You go first. Let me hear yours. Uh, Elwyn, one hundred percent, definitely. Gans, I love Gans. Uh, Gans, I think is just such a he he can be like a goofball, kind of incompetent at times, but again, he's he's another one that has the aura of a leader because he projects this confidence um there's a there's a quote from i'm i i really like star trek so i'll there's a scene in one of the this i think it's the next generation where um uh picard is asked you know like oh you don't really know where you're going do you when they're stuck on this planet and he goes because you know i have to project that confidence as a leader if I didn't do that, even if I'm not sure, you guys wouldn't follow me. And mm. I feel like that applies to Gans because you can tell that he's inexperienced, but he has the confidence. Absolutely. And it's, it's it makes it all the more heartbreaking when he lets his um, alcohol vice get in the way of him joining Jack and Theodore Van Cor. Mm. It's a really sad moment when they have to part um, near that point. Yeah, because you... you I just felt so sorry for him. You have this feeling that, like, you think that he's going to serve kind of the role that Clive does, right? Like, he's going to be your first mm -hmm. friend that's going to help you acclimate to this new world. And then the game is yeah. like, nope, he's gone. Bye-bye. <laughs> yeah. He he has his own really unique storyline that happens through the game. Yeah. He, he joins, like, the least likely faction in the town. And it's just like, oh, the Thieves Guild. Sure. Non-stop okay. laughs the whole time he's on the screen with them. Yes. <laughs> Uh, well, probably Gerald. Gerald's a really cool character. Um, Parsec. I love Parsec. Oh yeah. He his his voice, his personality, the fact that he is basically like they could have turned his character into this like just ho hum exposition dumper, but he he explains the rules of the world in a way that's so. There, there's like a real sense of mysticism to the game mm -hmm. and when he's explaining how the world works with the gold dragon and the silver dragon and the elementals it's it's like it's like you're just glued on every word that he says because you get the sense that he even though he acts like a complete goofball throughout most of the game just this like weird person he like like once the facade dies down you can tell that he is he is a 
powerful being mm -hmm. that that is has a lot of wisdom. Like you can just hear the the years on his voice. <laughs> it's it's some incredible voice acting from from the the actor. Uh, that's that's Bob Prappenbrook. That's Bryce's dad. Yeah. Mm. It's incredible, incredible stuff. Uh, that's really all I can think of on the top of my head. Uh, I'll pass it over to you. Okay. Um, so, I, I, and the other reason I wanted to go first, I could ruminate and think about my theory. <laughs> so, I would say the three for me um, one is going to be Alicia uh, or Alicia, hmm. um, a member of Theater Van Cor. She wears kind of like fl flowery or feathery helmet. Um, her hair is kind of like this reddish pinkish color. Um, but one of the things I always thought with her that was so interesting is that. She is kind of like this legacy to the um, throne or the, the mantle that Elwyn kind of protects of her like dead lover. Um, like she is his <laughs> granddaughter, I think, or descendant, something to that effect. Um, and so I just always thought it was cool that like this interaction between, and a little bit more of that is um, expanded upon in the manga, but this interaction between her, yes. her and Jack, and that's kind of like these are two people that come from these incredibly important lineages, and there's, there's a lot about lineage and family in the story of uh, Radiata stories. Um, but again, I, I love her story, and it's it just like, it does this thing where it gives you just enough, where you're like, I'm so invested, but I wanna know more, but the game doesn't give me more, but I wanna know like yeah. what is going on there. So I would say her. Um, the other character I would say is um, Nina. So Nina is, um, a member of the Radiata Knights, and she's very missable. Um, she's a very missable party member to recruit because you don't necessarily think to go back and recruit, you know, people from the castle like late in the game. And so when you go and you recruit her, she's very low level. She's like, I want to say maybe like level, maybe like less than level 10, you know, when you recruit her. And by the time you can recruit her, most of your party members are like level 50, level 60. So you're like, I'm never going to use this character. <laughs> but. If you actually do, you know, take the time to level her up, she's actually one of the most um, competent fighters in the entire roster, um, but you just have to split that time into leveling her up. But I, I'm more interested in her character, again, going back to the manga, because she has this really interesting relationship with Jack, where she's got this crush on him, and, you know, she's kind of got, like, this, this secret affection, and um, I was like, man, why didn't Jack just, like, you know, hang out with her instead of worrying about Ridley? Because in, in this story, um, Ridley is on the opposite side of the, the fence here, you know, they're on the opposite sides of this civil war, and so I was like, Jack, just yeah. just go, go with this girl, you know, she's on your side, like, and so I always thought that was a cool little interaction there. Um, and then my third character, I would say, and obviously, like, Elwin and, and, and all the the guild leaders that I would include in that list, but my, my, my third one, um, I'm going to say JJ, the giant green orc on the non-human side. Um, I love huh. sort of his arc in recruiting him in that Jack has to come to terms with kind of this, like, prejudice that he has uh, developed for orcs because of what happened to Ridley. Um, and they're like, hey, we need to go to recruit this orc leader. And Jack's like, orcs, like... I don't, how do you want to like work with orcs like they're violent and you know all they want to do is like kill and destroy and all these things and they're like well that's just maybe the interaction that you had but we need this guy like he's powerful and he can help us and so Jack has to like swallow his pride and he has this conversation with Ridley where she talks about forgiveness and how you can't just apply this one experience to this entire group of people um, and then you recruit JJ and uh, he's also one of the strongest characters in the game and his um I forget what it's called. I, I think his like ability or his skill um, gives him the ability to knock down. Like he has a higher knockdown rate than most characters. So in the final dungeon, he can literally like knock down anything that you fight, minus the dragons. See, I never knew that about. Like, I, I'm pretty sure I recruited JJ in my non-human playthroughs, but I don't remember that that touch of um, his development as far as the what happens with Ridley and her accident. Like, like way before that point mm -hmm. that's i need to go back and that gives me another reason to go back and replay it so i can see that that storyline yeah it's a it's a great little uh, little piece of like full circle because it does there's so many things that happen in the game where nothing i feel like is just a throwaway. like if you do a little side mm -hmm. quest you use it to re recruit another character or you do this side quest and you use it to tell that story to make a sick kid feel better who's dying in the hospital right or yeah. you, you go on this mission and now you have this context for why they need this character and all these things. Like one of the ones that I missed the very first couple times is the first time you go to the Goblin Cemetery and you get the recruitment suit and you have to use that silly code phrase like sesame seeds to get in. Oh yes. Um, when you're the, playing the non-human side. The crypt. 
when you're playing the non-human side and you go back and you're in Goblin Haven, um, <laughs> you're talking to this guy and he's like, I bet you don't know the, the top secret code to get inside of the cave. And he's like, it's sesame seeds. And he's like, what? That's like our most sacred secret. Like, how do you know that? And he was like, it's just in the <laughs> library downtown. Like, it's not that big of a deal. <laughs> Uh, next question, human or non-human side? Ooh, ooh, okay. So the way that I typically play now, my, my first playthrough, I went non-human because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a love story sucker. I was like, ah, Ridley, <laughs> I got to go behind her. Um, but the way that I typically play now, if, I, if I'm going to do a replay, is I do the non, or, or I do the human side first so that I can recruit, you know, arguably the most powerful characters in the game and then get this very powerful bonus skill that you get for completing it and then play through the non-human side because I actually find that the non-human side as far as from a, a game play, gameplay standpoint is much more difficult like the, the battles are much harder than the human side yeah. and most of that has to do with the party members that you have it's not that the non-human party members are completely useless it's just that they aren't as game breaking as some of the human characters are See, for me, like, the first time I played it, I went with the, the human side because I didn't want to lose access to characters I'd recruited, like like Gerald and uh, Nocturne. Um, and I also didn't want to leave Roddy out of City because I just I loved it so much and I wanted to stay. But going back, I always go through the non-human side mm. because, to me, that's the one that makes the most sense as far as my interpretation of Jack's. Jack's development yeah. as a character, <laughs> yeah. Because him, him just dismissing Ridley as like, oh, she's just rich girl problems. When you don't go with her to the City of Flowers, it just seems so inconsistent with what we've seen Jack go through and talk and say throughout like the whole set first half of the game. To then just dismiss like Ridley as like, oh, rich girl problems. It just seems so. No, it doesn't feel right. So. Him, him going to the City of Flowers with her, I, I genuinely believe that even if we didn't have a choice, I genuinely believe that he would have broken, you know, like like him him turning against humanity to side with Ridley, even if it meant siding with the elves. Absolutely. I totally believe that, just from everything we saw in the first half of the game. Well, I think it's interesting that like, you talk about his response to the human side of, like, oh, it's risk girl problems. The game... <laughs> It, it, it doesn't make you feel like the game never makes you feel good about picking the human side like it, it's kind of no. very blatant like this was the wrong choice like you know we, we gave you two options but this is the one that I feel like you leave feeling the most guilty about because when, when it's all said and yeah. done you walk away with literally nothing <laughs> like he's yeah. lost it's so tragic and and so that choice when he's like oh you know it's just rich girl problems you see a regression in his character and the game is almost kind of like, hey, mm -hmm. if you regress in your character development, bad things will happen to you. <laughs> yeah. And he, it just, the, the what happens in it with it with it just seems so. It's just it's like it's like the, like you said the game is like punishing you for, <laughs> you know, making this this almost selfish decision where you're just letting Ridley go like eh, whatever time to go to the castle yeah and then when all said and done it's like you never get to wield the arbitrator you never get to see Gans again you never get to um, team up with Ridley you're an you're enemy to all these fairy creatures that really you've done nothing to personally offend it's just, it's just such a just a, just a miserable I mean I still like playing through it just because of the the side quests and the some of the story beats that happen but it's just so sad compared to the non-human one and the non-human one is is bittersweet enough I don't need it in the, the human side even more than it already gets on the non-human side very true very true um, one question I got sent privately on Twitter was, what are some of our favorite locations in the game? Ooh, okay. Favorite locations. I'll start if you want some time to think yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I, I can think of one. Mm -hmm. Club Vampire. Ooh, nice. Um, mm -hmm. I love the theme of Club Vampire. I love the, the, um, the, like, the, like, the jazzy kind of nightclub vibe that it has where you walk in and there's a dartboard there's kind of like a like a table gambling uh, it's, it's so yeah yeah it's it's like so seedy and I, I love the atmosphere of it i love that you can just walk up and there's a there's the cook and you hear the sound of the grill as the music kicks in it's just it's it's in, it's a really incredibly well realized location in the game and it's it's just like one little thing that's hidden off like if you don't know how to access it it's it's kind of tricky to find 
but the reward of finding it is just this like really great area. Yeah, a hundred percent, definitely I would agree with that. Um, that was going to be one of the spots that I was going to say. Um, okay. <laughs> one of the locations that I am also a really big fan of is, hmm, I would say Forest Metropolis. I love oh, yeah. the little the little music that plays in the background and how when you walk, like Jack kicks leaves everywhere and there's constantly like leaves falling from the sky and everything just seems, it, it's kind of got this like, uh, almost like Pocahontas type feel, like this group of people mm. that are so in touch with nature and they're just living off the land and they want for nothing and they just have fun and it, it, it's, it's just such a great place, I, I feel like, and it really brings your mind at ease because when you think about when you're doing that mission for the very first time like oh my gosh you've made this long trek over to the city of flowers and now you have to make this long trek over to the forest metropolis but once you get there it's like ah like you can kind of like let your hair down and relax a little bit like it, it, it has that ambiance of this is a place where you can settle and relax and i love that yeah i'm a big sucker for fall atmosphere mm. in anything and that just I mean, Forest Metropolis just nails it. Just the the feeling of being in like a, like a continuous fall season. Um, I guess another location for me it would have to be the um, uh, the Goblin Haven. One hundred percent. That's a good thing. Uh, because I, I spent so much time in Goblin Haven trying to recruit <laughs> all the the black goblins and. I just I love the the music that plays. I think that the 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 music that plays during that on that location, like the very like wintry mm. kind of vibe. I, I love it. I love the, the all the characters that you meet there. I love that Gwen his his role in that location because I, that's one of my favorite parts of the game. Your encounter with Gwen there. Uh, I just I just love Goblin Haven, and I love I love that it's locked off and later on it's like oh there's this location that was right next to forest metropolis that i couldn't get to <laughs> and here it is it's this big win it's like the complete opposite of forest metropolis where forest metropolis is fall uh goblin haven is winter 100 percent. yeah yeah uh, another good spot um is i would say um like the 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 algandar's castle where it plays that very sad Ooh. music and you hear that, that very sad love story and the creation of the, the dark elves and how they came to be. And I, I, I just, I love that. It's like, there's so much story just like brimming inside of this location. And every room you go to, you kind of just like have this little like, okay, like what was this for? Like, was this a place where there was maybe like servants and, and maids and, and butlers or, or like, was this used as like a family room? Like, you, like all these things that, the only thing that could have maybe set it more over the top is if they had like portraits inside, you know? It's it's been a long time since I I did those side missions for Algandar's Castle, but I I remember the theme. I I can I can vividly hear it in my mind right now. It's a very distinct musical score. It's 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 such like a contrast compared to so much of the other music in the game. It's just, it's so sad. It's just, it's just it's just it just it aches listening to it. Um, I guess if we're gonna do three locations, my third one will be Earth Valley. Like I love Earth Valley. Mm. I love the music. <laughs> I love the dwarves. I love just the whole. Uh, similar to Goblin Haven and similar to Forest Metropolis and Club Vampire, I just love the unique ambiances that Roddy out of stories. The the various uh, topography that they're able to, like the the variety of topography that they're able to create in this world. Because no two cities feel the same. They each have their own distinct vibe. Like, City of Flowers does not feel like Forest Metropolis, which does not feel like Goblin Haven, which does not feel like Earth Valley, which definitely does not feel like Radiata City. It's just what they, what Trias were able to do as far as ambiance in this game is just old, like a world class stuff. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, and then I, I would say last one. Wait, did I do two or three? This is my third? You did two. Okay, okay. <laughs> last one for me. Is, again, I might be pronouncing this wrong. I've always said it like Borgondiazo. It's like the, the place where all the orcs live. Um, and it's a location that, again, is also missable um, on both playthroughs. If you're, if you're not going there for the specific, you know, reasons of recruiting JJ. And on the human side, they don't even tell you that it's open. It just opens up. <laughs> like, there's no, like, indicator like, oh, you can go here now. Like, you have to just be, like, walking and looking for it. 
um, and you can go in there and you can fight just orcs and it's like I love that feeling of like you're going in there and you're like, I'm gonna go head to head with the toughest like enemy in the game and you're in there with your like high level gear and your strong team and it's just like you feel this like like you have arrived sort of vibe like ah oh, this is the place where I get to put all my skills together and really see like how I match up to the strongest sort of enemies in the world it's a that location is that's that's one of the ones I don't I'm not as familiar with I am like the, there isn't that intimacy there like with Earth Valley and Club Vampire and Force Metropolis but I do I, I again that's another one where it's like I remember the theme yep. very well <laughs> the music man it's it's something special it sticks with you once you hear it it's crazy how how like even if you don't remember the specific location you can remember the feelings that you had almost going into it just from the music it's it, it's this is why I, I stress normally video game why video game music is just so important for a game like if, if you have boring video game music then the game's gonna suffer but if you have great music like Radio Out of Stories has it just adds a whole nother bunch of layers to it absolutely I would um, 100% agree an ultimate question oh sorry oh no I was just saying I agree yeah, I agree with what you said uh, penultimate question um, remake, reboot, or sequel? Mm. Uh, mm. I'd want a sequel, honestly. Okay, sequel, sequel. All right. Um, I'd, I'd want, like I said, I'd want something that was set in the future. Maybe not have Jack and Ridley as playable characters, but their their offspring, their their grandchildren, their great grandchildren, or, or something. I don't, something like that. Something far flung into the future, where maybe they have to contend with the dragons again in some respect. I think for me, it's definitely gonna be, um, it's gonna be remake in my, my dream world. Um, it's gonna be remake. Uh, reboot would be cool because again, you get to see different characters and that sort of thing, and maybe a retelling. But for me, it's I I dream about remake in that I want to see all of these people that have had the chance to hone their skills be able to try this again with full attention, full effort, full support, and not be pulled in so many different directions. Um, you know, like I think about mm. Final Fantasy VII Remake is a, is a great example. That That is an all-hands-on-deck project. That's not like a, yes. oh, we're just going <laughs> to work on it on the side. And, you know, they're able to make something that was really fantastic and really amazing, and I would love to see that for Radiata Stories. Now, granted, I do recognize that, you know, some of the cast might not be able to return in the same way, but... Even still, I would love to see a remake um, because I, I'm confident, like, I truly believe this in my heart, that if a remake was to come out, that it would sell well enough that we would get that sequel. Like, it would it would happen. There, there, ha there is definitely an audience out there for it. They just need to tap into it, mm -hmm. which if, if they're going to claim that it wouldn't happen, it's like, well, can you at least try first before you, you tell me that there isn't an audience <laughs> out there for it? Well, the because because the 2020 is a very different year compared to 20, 20, 2005 as far as video games and advertising goes. Absolutely, and the thing that I've always kind of thought is if you can sell Star Ocean to someone, you can sell Radiata Stories to someone. You yeah. know, and there's 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 so much overlap there in that that triace sort of just flair. The Star Ocean, the the Valkyrie profile. If you're gonna remake those games remake Radiata Stories. It, it stands in that category for me, and I think anyone that's played it would say the same thing as well. Yeah. And the final question before we end this conversation is, is there any chance Square will announce a Radiata remaster during July or August? <laughs> um, so for context, because E3 didn't happen this year, Square Enix has announced that they are going to be revealing games throughout the months of July and August. So I have no idea what that entails, honestly, because they're already they're already starting to reveal stuff, which is like okay, I don't know why you have to do that for July or August, but like they already revealed stuff like um, like you know another look at Avengers. They revealed the new the Kingdom Hearts Rhythm game, um, but as far as Roddy out of stories, I, I hate I hate to be like the pessimistic, <laughs> like the 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 negative Nancy, but I I very highly doubt it that they're going to. I'd love, I'd love if that were to happen. I would literally like hyperventilate if that happened, but <laughs> it would, it's a long shot as far as them, th this being one of their big re uh, announcements during July or August. I'm not saying it will never happen, but specifically in July or August, I'm gonna go with no in this case. And if you were a betting man, I'd, I'd say that that's the safe bet. 
Um, yeah. For me, um, I, I definitely lean more towards that way. But then this other part of me that thinks like, you know, there's, <laughs> I, I, I don't think that anything is ever done unintentionally when it comes to these big major brands. And we talked about this a little bit yesterday, but for folks that aren't familiar, and there's a mobile game it's called Star Ocean uh, Anamnesis. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Maybe. Oof. Um, but Jack and Ridley made an appearance in that game recently as, as as crossover characters. And it seems very strange to me that you would bring back characters that are 15 years old, add them as like sort of DLC more or less to your game if you weren't sort of plotting something with them. Because um, it wasn't just the fact that they showed up in the game, they showed up in like the, the weekly sort of um, little comic manga mini release that they do um, promoting it. Um, so I was like, okay, so they're adding them to the game, they're, they're drawing them, they're, they're, they, they remember these characters, like someone remembers these characters. And I like to think that, and maybe it's just me tooting my own horn, but I like to think that, you know, if they were on the fence about, oh, should we do this, should we not do this, a quick Google search, if you type in Radiata Stories now on Google, you know, Revive Radiata is one of the first things that's going to come up. You know, I would hope that they would see that and be like, okay, maybe this isn't a crazy idea. Um, so if there was ever a time, I, I think this could be it. Um, if there was ever a, like a prime opportunity, this could be the one. But do I think it'll happen? Likely no. But this would be a sure heck of a good time to do it if anyone at Square Enix or Triace is listening. This is a prime opportunity. I genuinely hope people from Square Enix or Triace listen to this and it's like, if you are, just look, let's, 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 come on, please, <laughs> please, please, take my money, stories, take please my give money. us back. Just, yeah, I, I am literally offering you my money. <laughs> All you have to do is just stretch out your hand, open your palm, and I will drop my money into your hand. It's, like, it's just that simple. <laughs> and it's, it's not like Square Enix has to beg like like disney or, or another or marvel or something for decisions regarding their game like like i'm pretty sure like either triace owns the rights or square enix owns the rights and considering triace and square enix still are in a working relationship i doubt there would be a lot if any friction to get a revival of radiata stories in the works i i, I have to believe that there is that it, it really would be that simple and it's just really the only obstacle is just getting the funds to do it mm -hmm. which square enix could just like take money it's making from its garbage mobile games and just go all right here fun <laughs> revive radiata there there we go let's do this they're making money off that new terrible kingdom hearts mobile game they can they can fund radiata stories it's it's wild whatever to think about too you're like oh my gosh like you got these franchises that are getting like their umpteenth spin-off sequel thing and like come on yeah radiata stories like just one more thing that's all we're asking for like I'm, I'm a big Kingdom Hearts fan, but even I'm like, how many people really were asking for a rhythm-based Kingdom Hearts game? Like, yeah, I don't know. That's a tough I, I, I kind of doubt that. <laughs> it certainly wasn't I. I certainly wasn't in that comment section. I can say that. No, I, I was not. But considering Ka it's, it's Kyrie's story, I, I'm gonna have to play it now. Which, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not gonna complain because I, I like, I like the concept. I just hope it's good. That's how. Uh, that's how Nomura um, gets you. He puts these very important story details in these oh spin-off games. Oh my God! Don't even get me started on Norm Nomura. Pop Papa Nomura. He's, oh God. Um. But yeah, that is. I think I'm well satiated as far as our conversation goes awesome i think this was this was a really nice conversation to have to actually talk to somebody for once who knows what radiata stories actually is and has a, a personal significance to it, it um and again before before we end i do want to again express a very heartfelt thank you not only for agreeing to have this conversation with me because you could have very easily just like looked at my my channel and just been like nope not <laughs> worth it but you did you, you took a leap of faith with me and and i'm very grateful for that and i'm also grateful for you for just starting revive radiata in general um like i said yesterday whenever i would put out a, a tweet in the past about radiata stories i'd get maybe five six most seven or eight people that would go oh yeah radiata stories great and that'd be the end of it. It was like the conversations would just die off. So to actually see a community, um, like like I said, like right at the beginning when you first started it, I think I, I think I tweeted at you and said this this account, right, Revive Radiata, is an account after my own heart or something <laughs> like, along those lines. 
And I genuinely mean that because Riot Stories has such a personal significance to me. It's one of my all-time favorite games. Like next to Kingdom Hearts 2, it's probably my favorite game ever made. And to see somebody create this campaign and basically almost like jumpstart revive the community in a sense to bring them all in a space where they can all interact beyond reddit obviously that like reddit has its own community but i'm talking about something where you are like actively pursuing this as far as like getting in contact with square enix getting in contact with triace getting in contact with the the voice actors and and them them maybe bringing up nostalgic feelings for them i think what you're doing is important incredible work and all i can say is if there are people out there that are trying to dissuade you from doing this screw them <laughs> you know you you are you are doing good great work with this and just thank you from the bottom of my heart me to you thank you so much for this that means the world like that's that's why i mean really kind of why i wanted it you know because i knew that it would it would have that feeling for the people that have played it and would create that feeling for the people that haven't played it yet. You know, it, it really is something special. And um, I was reading this post a while ago about how it's beautiful that we are moving to a place in our society where we romanticize video games the way that we romanticize mm -hmm. uh, stories or, or just traditional yeah. books like Harry Potter. You know, people would get lost in Harry Potter. And now people get lost in things like Fallout. They get lost in things like Final Fantasy and, and all of those things. And I think that's so beautiful. And Roddy Otto's stories, I think, is a story that needs to be read. It's a story that needs to be played through, a story that, that needs to be experienced. And uh, granted, I also recognize it's 15 years old and Mm -hmm. The gameplay holds up, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but it's not, you know, the over-the-top, super snappy action that, you know, you might expect from an action RPG. But if you play through the experience and really just kind of you know, let your mind sink into this world, it is something like no other. And I'm just so happy that I get to talk to people like you about it and that there are people like you that remember Radiata stories the way that I do because... Again, it was so special to me, and, and I had that, that great memory of it, and, and still have great memories of it. And I think that this movement, um, when when it's successful, <laughs> when it is successful, mm -hmm. I think that it will it will set a precedent for how to get things done in terms of bringing people to the conversation. Going on angry tirades and and you know messaging these these publishers and these companies, you know these hateful messages about how yeah. they suck and they don't listen. That's not the way to get it across. It, it's it's showing the love, showing the support, showing the the dedication to something. That's what gets people to come in and to listen to what you have to say. And I think that when Square um, takes a look at this, you know, when, when those eyeballs finally do glance in our direction. They will see a community that is beautiful and, and filled with support and filled with just these 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 great feelings, and they'll say, "Oh, we want more of that." You know, that's the yeah. kind of fans that we want. You know, yeah. who do, who doesn't want their brand to be associated with a group like that? Yeah. Um, and like, so that's my hope. That's my vision. Um, and I think that Triace is to some extent already on board. I think there might be a little bit of a language barrier in our emails <laughs> when we go back and forth, um, but. From what I can tell, they, they seem happy, they seem flattered by what we're doing. Now that obviously wasn't a nod of like, yes, we're gonna do it, mm -hmm. um, but they're definitely aware that we exist and that we are doing good things and it's something that, again, they're happy about. They're not mad that we're trying to revive Roddy Auto Stories. Is it gonna ignite anything in them? Only time will tell, but it, I, it makes me feel happy knowing that they are flattered by the work that we are doing. Yeah. It's what's the, what's the age old expression where it's easier to it's easier to attract flies with honey than with vinegar in the case of yep <laughs> go, and, and in the case of trying to convince these publishers to give these dormant properties a chance I mean there I and I, I'm you know I I'm a big proponent of anger in select cases but in the terms of cases <laughs> like this no that's not the way to go at all and I think what you're doing building a community a positive community around this game this long forgotten game is is the right way to go and don't let anyone dissuade you otherwise <laughs> i got you covered i promise i'll keep carrying the torch right. that's the move um and before we end yeah just um where can people find you oh yes um so starting with the radiata story stuff uh, you can find uh, us at revive radiata on twitter um, you can also find uh, the, the campaign at change.org uh, forward slash um, Revive Radiata. If you Google hashtag Revive Radiata, all of our stuff will come up. 
Um, if you're interested in following me and learning more about me, um, you can follow me at the Eli Farmer, and that's on all platforms. I'm the Eli Farmer on Instagram. I'm Eli, the Eli Farmer um, on Twitter. I'm the Eli Farmer uh, I'm on, or actually, I'm just Eli Farmer on Facebook. But all that good stuff. Um, and then my website, if you want to hear my demos and hear me do wacky character voices or scary monster sounds, oh, uh, you can follow me um, uh, on my website at elifarmer.com, and you can listen to my demos and hear all the fun things that I do there. So that's all the places you can find me. Excellent. Um, you have a Discord as well, correct? Yes, yes. Uh, my Discord is Farmer EA14 is my personal one, um, but there's also a Revive Radiata Discord if you want to come chat with us about Radiata stories. Oh, also, gonna plug um, the subreddit. It's literally just Radiata stories. Uh, if you go to reddit.com, Radiata stories, we're always posting and doing fan art and those sorts of things over there. So there's plenty of places to find Radiata stories. You just got to know where to look. Yeah. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to say is if you haven't watched it yet, please go to YouTube and check out the Revive trailer for Radiata stories. Um, it was a really cool project that I got to put together and, and slap together some clips of how I imagined a Radiata Stories trailer should look. You know, if we were going to do it right and we were trying to get people excited about it, it's my sort of vision of, of how I would do a trailer for the game. So go check it out. I'd love to get that, you know, to a thousand views. And um, I, I think that if we can get to a point where it is a, a, a top result when people Google Radiata Stories, it'll do great work for our petition and our campaign. I really liked that. <clears throat> I really liked that trailer that you made, by the way. I that awesome. Was, I'm, I'm glad. It, it warmed my heart to see somebody actually make a new trailer for Roddy Out of Stories, which is something I never in my life thought I would see. But. <laughs> well, it's just one of those things where, again, I feel like it didn't get its fair shot. But, no, you know, I, I'm not a professional, but, like, thinking back to the first two that I saw, they were, I don't think they, they really show you what Roddy Out of Stories is, you know, in any way. Right. Um, like, the, the things that would really, like, catch your eye. And my goal was, obviously, I couldn't get the charm and the humor across, but I wanted to get you, like, this is cool. Like, this is a cool thing. This is something to be excited about. And I hope that people get that from watching the Revive trailer. Yeah. Definitely worked for me. 100%. <laughs> uh, nice. All right. So, again, thank you so much for allowing me to talk to you. It's been a great <laughs> pleasure to do that. And as always with me, um, I am Razorblade Mango. Um, thank you so much for watching, even if you're new to the channel. Thank you so much for coming by. Um, thank you for letting me talk to you, good sir. Of course. And I think we'll call it a day from here. All right. All right. Catch you guys Until later. Until next time, peeps. <laughs>